Hello, this is uh, a re-recording of my talk given uh, for the Herbert A. Simon Award in Cognitive Systems, uh, the Advanced in Cognitive Systems uh, Conference, uh, where the, due to technical problems, the original presentation was not recorded. <clears throat> I'm very honored to have received this award and uh, Today I'm going to give a uh, more reflective talk rather than something on uh, technical details on my recent research. Um, conversational systems, past, present, and future. So starting, I'm going to start with the very beginnings of the field and move through and uh, comment on work we've done and the current trends and a few thoughts of, uh, about the future. Um, so looking at the beginnings back when, before I was a graduate student, uh, Eliza was really the first chatbot uh, developed in the 1960s, um, was tremendously successful. Uh, uh, the program played the role of a therapist. You have things like men are all alike. Eliza says, in what way? Um, they're always bugging us about something or other. Can you think of a specific example? And so on. Uh, goes through and Eliza can keep on a conversation for quite some time and a lot of people uh, used it and, uh, and it seems to have some uh, interesting behaviors. So, you know, my mother takes care of me, who else in your family takes care of you? Or uh, perhaps I could learn to get along with your, my mother. Tell me more about your family. Uh, how does Eliza work? Well, it was a simple pattern matching uh, language written and it used a few lexical tricks just to do with some lexical generalization, um, but otherwise was driven by these uh, essentially a, a set of tables um, that basically match for words in the sentence, a pattern for the whole sentence uh, and uh, a rankings. Uh, so you can choose if multiple patterns match and then what some outputs that you can do. So if someone says, men are all alike, we might match to two patterns here. Uh, and uh, in looking at the ranking, <clears throat> we'd see that uh, 10, it would come back and say, in what way? And that basically is it. This is how Eliza works. Um, so we probably all agree that Eliza doesn't understand language um, at all. It's a simple collection of tricks. Uh, but it seems to function quite well. Um, and there's some reasons for that. First is the domain. There's no domain knowledge required here to be the therapist. And uh, there are always a system could do a vague continuation if it doesn't have anything else to say, like tell me more. Um, but also it appears that uh, humans have some innate ability to interpret language in order to make it coherent. So. Uh, we will find an interpretation that makes the most sense at any time when we hear language. Um, and so Eliza really appears intelligent because you do all the work to make Eliza's responsible seem reasonable. Um, and some call this the Eliza effect. And it makes evaluating conversational systems a challenge. Um, the second system uh, from those early days was Winograd Sherdlou which was essentially a conversational system with a, with a simulated blocks world um, and could understand quite uh, complex sentences, like find a block which is taller than the one you were holding and put it in the box. And from this scenario here, you can see it holding, it'll put the, in the box. And we'll end up with a scenario like this, where the colors are actually now in, uh, so you can see what's going on. And uh, short Lou, uh, could show quite sophisticated behavior, can answer questions about the world, like what does a box contain? It says the blue pyramid and the blue block. What is the pyramid supported by? And the box, um, and so on. Uh, can the table pick up blocks? No. Uh, so that's uh, the Schertelou system. Uh, it had a huge impact on work in the 60s, 70s. Um, and the key points in there, are uh, first that uh, language and sentences have a hierarchical structure. So it was driven by a grammar that directly relates to its the sentence's meaning. And in Schurdelou, the meaning was a procedure that could operate and execute on the blocks world. 
Um, interpretation depends on the context of the situation strongly, both linguistic context, like in uh, what is the pyramid? There were multiple pyramids in that scene, but the pyramid is referring to the one we were just talking about um, and situational context. Uh, and so this is a strongly contextual interpretational language. Um, and responses depended on reasoning about actions in the world. So moving a block will change the situational context for the next sentence. Uh, so Schertelou was based on a, basically a set of embodied a theory, a set of principles encoded as rules uh, across a wide range of uh, different phenomena, like pragmatic rules, a definite noun phrase should resolve to a known object or knowledge rules, only my arm can move objects and so on. So those are two quite different systems, uh, both developed early on in the field. Uh, let's compare them for a bit. Uh, so on performance, we see Eliza, as we already saw, gave, gives the illusion of understanding um, by restricting the genre of conversation and crafting vague continuations, it produces a quite convincing system. Uh, and Eliza and its descendants have been in active use for well over 50 years now. Um, I would say this is clearly the most successful uh, chatbot of all times. And in fact, most modern successful chatbots also use techniques similar to Eliza. Um, so it's uh, performance wise, Eliza is impressive. Shirt Lu, on the other hand, operated from a theory, implemented a set of rules, and it was easy to make sure to Lou fail. You give it some outer domain input or, uh, or try to talk about something that isn't blocks and moving blocks, it, it, it rapidly fails. Um, so on performance, Eliza still comes clearly out ahead. Uh, what about uh, what it says about theory of language? So an important part of any theory is it should be falsifiable. Otherwise, it's not really making specific claims about the world. Uh, Sher de Luz sparked significant new work in computational models and, psych and psycholinguistics. And, uh, and the subsequent work found the techniques didn't generalize as people hoped. Um, uh, there were, the big parsing became much more difficult. Uh, it couldn't, uh, generalizing to things other than a simple physical world caused problems. Uh, and that triggered a lot of new work in the, uh, in the field. Uh, where Eliza really presented no falsifiable, falsifiable theory. Um, you could say, oh, look, uh, I, I did play with Eliza. It can't perform this sort of interaction. Well, you can just add a few rules that do that interaction now, recognize it and do it. And now it can do it. Um, so you, you, you can't kind of pin Eliza down and say, it can't do this, it can't do that. And who knows what Eliza with millions or billions of rules might uh, be able to do. And this is significant to a discussion later on, on on some modern systems. So we'll come back to that kind of issue. So why did I spend a third or a quarter a third of my talk talking about two 60 year old systems? Um, the reason is, <laughs> These two um, present two common divergent themes and trade-offs that uh, are still true today. And it's between perf system performance and uh, system theory. And the trade-off persists to this day. So uh, now we'll move on and uh, start talking about work subsequent to that. So in the next few decades, we have a, a quite a flurry of work uh, looking at connecting language and reasoning together. And the key idea to do that was to start encoding mental states. And by mental states, essentially, we uh, where was work on developing agents that embody uh, the kinds of knowledge such as uh, forming a goal or intention. So you want uh, to put a block on another block or planning to achieve a goal uh, or adopting a plan as an intended course of action or executing the plan that you adopted. Um, 
So these are all kind of fundamental concepts in an intelligent agent. And, uh, and uh, there was a lot of work developing uh, these models. Uh, uh, in addition, there was a development of theories of planning uh, with the strips and the situation calculus formalisms. Um, and then these actions are functions from one world to another. Uh, the key thing in these formalisms is that actions have preconditions, uh, conditions that should be true in the state if an action is to be performed and affects what becomes true in the state after the action is performed. And so a plan then is just a sequence of actions that transforms an initial state into a state where a goal holds. So here's just a, a little a figure with a stack in the stacking world. Again, we have a stacking action says the two blocks must be clear and the effect is that y, uh, X is on Y. And once we instantiate it to this world um, and we can reason that if we performed a stack action, we'd now be in this world. Uh, interestingly, uh, this is still the predominant model underlying planning systems today. Um, so the theory hasn't uh, changed that much. So now we have models of planning and intelligent agents, we can go back and look at connecting it to language. And the key idea here is the notion of speech acts, which were developed uh, by in the philosophy of language. Um, and these are actions we perform by speaking, uh, things like we inform someone of something, we request something of someone, we promise something, we apologize, uh, and so on. These are all actions that are performed by speaking. Uh, and so in early work uh, by myself and uh, my advisor Ray Perot and Phil Cohen, we formalized speech acts in a theory of planning and plan recognition. Um, and so a request action uh, would be uh, the speaker requests an action of the hearer uh, precondition in order to be sincere it's the speaker wants the action to be performed. And the effect is the hearer believes the speaker wants the action to be performed. Um, so that's a direct effect of the action and then subsequent reasoning about what this, the hearer's reasoning uh, would lead you to the intended effect of a request, which is uh, that the hearer does the action. So with this uh, connection, um, we, can, we have a, essentially a model of language connected to reasoning about the world. And just to see this schematically, let's consider two agents Sam and Sue, and Sam is uh, starts off and has a goal to eat a peach. <clears throat> With a little reasoning then, Sam decides, well, if I'm going to eat a peach, I need to find one. I need to know where a peach is. A little more planning, he might say, well, I think Sue knows where peaches are, so I'll ask Sue where a peach is. And now we've got a speech act here in the plan, which can be used uh, generally, can be pushed through a language generation process and you come up with a action, a speech sentence that says, do you know where I can find a peach? So we have gone from planning, goal formation and planning all the way through generation to language. Uh, now Sue's uh, role in this is the opposite. It's got to do, instead of generation, we're doing understanding, and instead of planning, we're doing plan and intention recognition. Uh, so Sue hears, do you know where I can find a peach? Uh, looking at that and reasoning about what the uh, explicit intention is, Sue would infer, Sam asked me where a peach is. Uh, with some goal recognition, Sue might infer Sam wants to know where a peach is, otherwise why would they have asked for it? Um, and from that, uh, Sue might infer that, well, you know, if it's, what do you do with peaches? You, know, you eat them and so I'd infer it's likely that Sam wants to eat a peach. So there we've completed the cycle from Sam's goal all the way to Sue's knowledge of Sam's goal. And uh, this was accomplished by language. So this was the kind of key idea underlying the speech act theory of language. Uh, so with that, you can uh, <clears throat> uh, sketch out a conversational agent. Uh, so we have an agent who's sitting listening 
uh, another agent says something, we then infer the intention. We then from that uh, uh, plan that they've recognized, we identify uh, what obstacles there are in the plan, what would be preventing the agent from performing the plan. And then uh, as an instance of helpful behavior, we then adopt a goal to remove those obstacles, which then leads to planning and the plan to remove the obstacles, which may involve speech acts, which when then uh, are planned out and then when executed, uh, we have the response. And if we just keep going around this circle again and again and again, we have a conversation. So the plan-based model uh, accounted for uh, uh, some interesting phenomena in language that, that uh, doesn't have an obvious uh, answer uh, without it. Um, one is helpful responses. So this is a conversation in a grocery store. The customer comes up to a clerk and says, black beans. And the clerk says aisle three. Okay, so these are highly fragmented utterances, but they make a very coherent conversation. Why? Because of the no knowledge of the intentions uh, by the two agents. So the, in the grocery store, uh, the most obvious intention for saying black beans is uh, I need to know where the location is, which is what the clerk uh, addresses in their conversation. It also, um, we showed it uh, counted for conventional indirect speech acts that you can actually uh, account for these purely by reasoning from, from their literal meaning. So can you tell me the time ends up as a request uh, for the time uh, and so on. And situational indirect speech acts shows how can you reach the salt can be uh, used as a request to pass the salt at the dinner table, for instance. Okay, so moving on, uh, the, the next uh, development in, in these uh, dialogue theories were task-based dialogue systems. And here, what the observation was that um, as we perform tasks, if we're talking about, uh, if we're talking to another agent while we're performing a task, the dialogue can be accounted for uh, and roughly follows the execution of the task. So here's a simple dialogue. Um, and uh, you can account for all these uh, interactions here by their relation to this task over here. So I need to get to New York is identifying a goal and it's uh, over here. The, the next part is, uh, uh, this question answer pair, do you want to go by train? Yes, that's basically establishing a method to achieve the goal. You'll need a ticket is identifying uh, a, a part of the plan that needs to be achieved. Uh, and this, then there's another question here, where do I get one at the station? So that establishes basically uh, a precondition for the buying the ticket. So we see we have uh, a dialogue over here, we have a task over here, and we have a set of different uh, interactions uh, which show how the a dialogue might relate to the task that's being performed, including stating goals, establishing methods, identifying a problem with the method, and so on. So this uh, led to development a wide range of uh, different uh, models of what we call a multi-level intentional models. And in this analysis I just gave, note there are two levels of intention that you need to deal with. Uh, the first is the domain level. Um, and this is the plan that's executed. This would be taking a trip, buying a ticket, boarding a train, and so on. Uh, the second level is a collaborative problem solving uh, level. And this is where we talk about the plan being executed by the conversation. So introducing a goal, evaluating a goal, identifying a needs, needing needed resource and so on. And so to understand the intentions in the dialogue, we have to do at least these two. Um, and there's a flurry of work on multi-dialogue models in the, uh, uh, <clears throat> in the 1980s and 90s. Um, including some multiple, some with three or four levels uh, of intention. 
just an example of a system like this was our the namesake TRIPS system, um, which has formed a foundation for a lot of uh, uh, my research group's work over the last two decades. Um, but this was the original system. It was doing evacuation planning, trying to figure out how to uh, transport all the people on an island uh, to a certain port where we could get them off before a hurricane hit. Um, <clears throat> so we go through and establish a, the user states the goal here and we go through develop a plan to evacuate the island. Um, and these were the most common actions performed on the plan at this uh, problem solving level. We added goals, sub goals, uh, goals and sub goals. We added actions to achieve goals. We modified goals and actions. We requested evaluation of, of a course of action along some dimension, like how long would that take? Um, or we can compare alternate solutions. So uh, basically the, the, each utterance in the uh, dialogues here could be accounted for by being one of these problem solving acts. Okay. Shifting a bit, the other uh, uh, large body of work that starting in the 90s uh, for dialogue systems are frame-based slot filling systems. Uh, this was uh, sparked by significant funding from DARPA in spoken dialogue systems. So suddenly uh, people started needed to start building dialogue models. And they really revived ideas from the GUS system in 1977 that would drove a dialogues uh, through a process of filling slots. So here we have a, a simple model of a, of a system that can do airline queries. And what it needs to know is a flight number, a travel date, and uh, whether we want to know the departure time or arrival time. And this is everything you need in order to formulate a query to the airline schedule database and everything you need to actually build a whole dialogue system. So here's an example of how a, such a system uh, would work. Um, so here we have a set of fields and each one has a pattern that can be matched against the input. Um, so a flight is an airline name followed by a number. Uh, the events are we're interested in arrivals and departures. City would be a list of city names. Uh, the query type would be uh, when or where or whatever else kind of thing you might be querying. <clears throat> and so, uh, and then there's a slot here that actually uh, gives system responses when, uh, when it needs a value for a slot that isn't uh, specified. So if we have an example, when does US Air 101 leave? We see that we have uh, when would match here and we fill that slot. US Air 101 would match here and we fill that slot. Leave would match here and we fill that slot. And we look down and this slot is uh, necessary and uh, unfilled. So the system asks what airport? Uh, when the uh, response comes back, uh, The user says Chicago, uh, that gets filled in this slot here. Um, and now all the necessary slots are filled. The system has enough information to do the database query and come back with the answer. So basically the whole dialogue system is, can be driven from just specifying these, uh, these uh, frames. So the, the frame-based systems are, are, are still very uh, uh, influential and popular. And, uh, the, probably the bulk of work in dialogue uh, systems to date are using this, this, this kind of representation. Um, the pluses are it gives you robustness of the language. Because you're doing these domain-specific pattern matching, you get very robust language interpretation, especially uh, in the presence of noisy input from speech recognition. Um, and the simple dialogue control algorithm is of applicable across multiple tasks. You don't have to build a dialogue manager. You just have to define a frame for the new task. So these are big pluses. Um, the minuses are that, well, the tasks are highly limited. Uh, each uh, dialogue concerns only a single operation that the system can perform, right? You've got to fill in this frame and, uh, and then we're basically done. 
So it's uh, um, the tasks are very simple. Uh, and there's no notion of kind of planning a complex task like we saw in uh, the previous examples with trips. Uh, and the tasks must be all predefined. They're all basically a set of frames. Um, this work evolved into what's now called state-based dialogue systems. Uh, and in this case, the main generalization is, well, the state's a partially instantiated frame. And uh, now in the state-based model, the output of language understanding is a probability distribution over states. So we have something like, uh, how can I help you in this res restaurant reservation system? And someone says an Italian restaurant. And let's say it's kind of noisy on the speech recognition here. Um, but through language, it computes probabilities of what slots might be filled. And these get combined into a probability distribution over uh, likely states. So the most likely uh, uh, <clears throat> state here is prices cheap, but that has a still a low priority um, to the uh, null hypothesis, which is, is none of these above. Um, and so in this case, the system would come back with a response of a clarification rather than move ahead. Uh, the clarification is not very coherent, but the user uh, pushes on and says Italian, which again goes through the uh, interpretations. Uh, and by combining those probability distributions, we now have this. And now we see that food is Italian is now uh, by far the most likely state um, from combining the evidence from both those sentences. So the really big plus here is that we note the best intent now is that the user wants Italian food, even though this was never the most likely interpretation in either of these utterances. So there's a lot of work still ongoing in state-based dialogue systems, uh, where there's a whole literature on uh, formalizing the dialogue policies on deciding what the system should do in response based on the probability distribution of states, a lot using POM uh, DP models uh, and uh, trained on annotated corpora. Um, there's a lot of work now on using uh, neural networks and deep learning to try and learn robust uh, parsing rules uh, to actually match sentences to possible slot values. And we also see uh, work now on end-to-end -end neural network systems uh, that are trying to uh, essentially encode state information in the models um, so that then you could have an end-to-end -end dialogue system just driven by a neural network. So we move along the Siri breakthrough. Uh, Siri was released in 2011. Uh, and it was the first conversational system to find widespread commercial use and was soon copied. Um, now, while differing in the details, Siri-like systems uh, handle only simple tasks um, and essentially equivalent to frame-based systems. And a lot of the techniques they use uh, are, are similar to the frame-based systems. They're often focused on filling in slots you know, on, on a task model. Um, so conversation with Siri is basically, as with the frame-based models, it's just a series of disconnected single simple tasks. So as you can see, even nowadays, a decade later, Siri is not capable of, of putting uh, several utterances together to try and understand a more complex task than the simple ones it has. And here's an example I, uh, I did in the last couple of months on the current version of Siri. Um, I said, hey, Siri, set an alarm for 6 p.m. And it says, OK, I set your alarm for 6 p.m. Um, but in fact, uh, I go on and say, I need to call John then. Uh, but there's no ability to uh, merge these two together into an intention that I should remind you to call John at 6 p.m. Uh, in fact, Siri comes back and now is treating this as a whole separate utterance now. And so, shall I call John H? Uh, and you say, I say, not now. And then it says, who do you want to call? So it's kind of fixated now on the fact that it, I'm going to make a call now. Uh, and I say, I don't want to call anyone now. And it's, it's gone off the wire now and uh, comes back with a, 
I don't know how I got this interpretation, but it clearly things go off track very quickly as soon as you try even the simplest generalization on the complexity of the task. But as you know, uh, everybody knows, these conversational systems are immensely popular um, and used, and they do for simple tasks, uh, do uh, make things more efficient. So moving to the present day and current research um, beyond these conversational assistants, there's uh, continuing work on uh, assistants, chatbots, and neural models. Uh, there's two main goals motivating research uh, in this area. One is sort of like the original ELISA motivation, which is, I just want a system that can carry on an extended plausible conversation. Uh, so that's one class of work going on. Uh, the second class is like the conversational assistants like Siri and um, uh, it's uh, you're accomplishing simple tasks or a phone call system. So directing a phone call to the right department, suggesting items to buy uh, by Alexa or making reservations for a restaurant on Siri. Interestingly, this, the simplest te simple techniques still dominate. We still got a lot of Eliza-like pattern response rules and use of uh, basic techniques like finite state machines to give a dialogue flow uh, and other things like that, plus attempts to continue to merge uh, chatbot techniques with frame-based dialogue models. Uh, most recently in the last five, 10 years, new neural network models um, uh, based on transformer techniques uh, can map entire sentences into n-dimensional encodings that give us uh, ability to model sentence similarity and, uh, and other sentence relations. And so such systems can be trained to predict uh, the most likely next sentence given a current sentence in various different contexts. For instance, given a question, it might predict an answer. Or given a starting sentence, it might generate the next sentence in a story and then possibly recurse and generate a, a longer story just by continuing to predict uh, the sentence that follows. So these systems are, are, are generating a lot of interest um, and have some impressive capabilities for generating coherent sounding sentences. Um, and this is one of the most impressive uh, this is a GPT-3 and uh, doing question answering task. And you can see that uh, in the an question answer, excuse me, to the question, who is the leader of the Wagner group? It gives a long uh, answer uh, talking about Dmitry Yukin uh, and gives a whole biography of him. And this is all generated uh, by the uh, neural network. Um, and this is not just pulling out sentences from other sources, it's actually constructing these sentences uh, compositionally. Um, so thoughts about this, this seems very impressive. Uh, the output seems coherent over whole paragraphs, but remember again, the Eliza effect, right? We're gonna, we're gonna read it in a way that will make it sound pretty coherent. And in a biography, you could shuffle a lot of these sentences uh, and it wouldn't uh, necessarily uh, make much difference. Uh, these uh, require huge, and I mean huge, we'll go that in the next slide, language models, including you know, all like Wikipedia articles on Dmitry Yupkin and stuff where a lot of this might be drawn from. Uh, but the system itself has no conception of what it said and actually, no conception of whether what it said was true. And these systems do have, uh, these systems can produce sentences that sound good, uh, that not necessarily that are true facts. Um, and it also uh, it doesn't even have an idea of why, why would it generate such a long answer to this question? Um, you know, it doesn't have a model of, well, the user wanted a biography of this guy. Maybe they just wanted the name. Um, that the system's trained to do this, and this is what it does. Um, and because, so because of these, especially these last ones, um, Bender et al. call uh, these kind of systems stochastic parrots. 
which I think is a wonderful name. Uh, generally, uh, you know, it can they can generate coherent language without necessarily any uh, understanding of what is being said. Uh, back to those language models. This is a table got, drawn, drawn from that Bender et al. Um, and you can see these are some of these, uh, these models uh, have a truly staggering uh, number of parameters for training. So I can't even, I don't even know the name of this number. Uh, uh, I don't know how you'd say it in, in English. Um, it's a mind boggling number of parameters that then need to be trained by, of course, a mind boggling amount of data. Uh, uh, which also is uh, uh, generate, uh, uses huge amounts of energy in order to compute these models. So some observations on this, the problems of this line of research. Um, I, first thing is, unless you're a big company with big budgets, you can't play this game, right? This is, this is uh, beyond what any uh, research group could be able to do. Um, furthermore, now, while the performance looks impressive, the systems are totally opaque. Nobody uh, has a, an, an idea of why the system said what it said. There, there's, uh, um, and in particular, of great interest, if you wanted to commercialize this as a, like as a conversational assistant, like a better theory, um, you'd have a big problem because if the system produces a bad response, it's not clear how you'd fix it. Okay, you can try throwing more training data, but now we're already at 750 gigabytes of uh, uh, data or more uh, required. Uh, it's not clear how much you'd have to throw at it. Um, and because it's, you know, again, the other bad, uh, unfortunate result of the opaqueness is results research results are exclusively performance-based, okay? It's just that we built it and we made, tweaked it, tweaked it this way and we got better performance on some score. Um, gives us no gain into any theoretical insight about language or conversation. So how well do all these, putting this all together, what, uh, what can we uh, say about how they go? Um, well, one is, um, there are contests around one, the most recent uh, one is the Alexa Prize where um, they're trying to test how good a conversational system you can build. Um, so the social bot challenge of our Alexa is creating a system that can engage in fun, high quality conversation on popular societal topics for 20 minutes and achieve an average user rating of four out of five. Um, so the users at the end uh, kind of rank on how uh, they, much they would like to have another conversation with the system. And that's what the score would be. Um, the last two winners, 2020 uh, was Amora from Emory University with seven and a half minutes approximately and a score of 3.8. Um, the uh, 2021 winner uh, was Czech Technical University uh, which had a lot longer uh, conversation, average duration of 14 minutes, 14 seconds, but an average rating of uh, 3.28. And actually, I don't know, they combine these to get an overall score, um, and I'm not sure of the details there. <clears throat> but in any event, what, do, what did these systems do, uh, these winning systems? How were they built? Well, both of them were built uh, by students at universities. Um, and they're basically, the dialogue models are, they're basically simple rule-based models, essentially uh, like finite state machines. So they're going through and basically sketching out possible dialogues as they go along. Um, and you can see this is uh, Namora here. And uh, this is a chat tech one. What do you do in your free time? And if they say, I listen to music, it'll say, what genre is your favorite? Uh, and I, you know, we can have various answers. And of course, uh, they have to anticipate that the user says something that doesn't quite match one of the responses they have. So a lot of work has gone into how do you generate a uh, uh, continuation when you've got an out of domain response. Um, note that these systems, while they're, they have, the dialogues are 
quite simple uh, um, models. Um, they actually do use a lot of off the shelf components, uh, uh, many built using machine learning techniques, things like sentiment analysis, named entity recognition, topic and intent classification, and so on. Um, so they are um, bringing in a lot of uh, current technology that's been built over the last uh, few decades and, and using them in order to get good performance out of these. But the dialogue models remain really simple. So despite massive investments in machine learning systems and unimaginably large language models, um, these learned systems still can't beat a group of dedicated students building a rule-based system. Um, okay, wrapping up to finish here. Um, uh, currently, I'd say there are kind of divergent lines of research going on in conversational systems. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, I have to uh, admit that there's very few researchers still working on theory-driven conversational systems. Um, you'll see some work in uh, this conference here, um, but not much else elsewhere. Um, companies uh, building commercial assistance and stuff are, are essentially focused on building ever more flexible uh, assistance, um, but not so much on generalizing uh, the behavior beyond these frame-based task models. It's almost as though the frame-based model has defined what it means to be a conversational agent. And they, know, they don't work on tasks more that can't be encoded within a frame. Um, and most of the research community is off exploring uh, machine learning techniques, focusing on performance uh, with little attempt to advance uh, the theories of conversational agents. So really, I'd say we're in a, kind of a dark age of theory uh, and possibly a golden age of performance. Systems are doing tasks we never believed they uh, could do that look really good, um, but uh, we're kind of stalled on, on the theoretical underpinnings. So the future. So in some sense, it would be uh, what we really want to do is somehow bring these lines of research back together. And there's two basic paths forward that I can see. Um, the first is developing uh, principled systems with richer dialogue models that depend on machine learning to perform component tasks. So here, uh, this is similar to the strategies that the winning chatbots did. So they do intent uh, classification or they do uh, sentiment analysis and then essentially drive dialogue on uh, um, the outputs of those kind of components. So you could see um, building richer dialogue models uh, using a lot of uh, these techniques. And there is one company uh, uh, building a commercial framework right now um, that is uh, pursuing this uh, and uh, being driven by the speech act planning frameworks that I discussed earlier, um, and but trying to put those into a uh, industrial strength conversational agent. The other way to go is develop techniques to embed richer conversational dialogue models into a neural network architecture. Um, to some extent, uh, people are working towards this already and that there has been work on, on in integrating essentially state-based models into a neural network architectures to try and get better, uh, being able to model conversations <clears throat> better. Um, and there's some work trying to look at how we might embed com uh, cognitive architectures in neural networks. Um, but in some sense, these models are still essentially evaluated solely on performance and, and lack uh, transparency. So that's a, a, a persistent problem with this. And I think uh, in some ways, well, I don't know, uh, it would, in some ways I think is a problem that needs to be, uh, we need a breakthrough uh, on uh, if we're going to this, uh, basically transparency of these systems is something that just, uh, desperately needed. So I just end with the hope that 
um, we can bring the strengths together of these approaches uh, into transparent systems that can yield high performance and also reveal underlying insights about how conversation works. And I thank you very much for your attention during this talk. And uh, again, I'm very honored by this award and uh, good luck to all the researchers out there and what you're developing these better models in the future. Thank you. <laughs>